We are joined today by Dr. Jeremy Jackson, the William E. and Mary B. Ritter Professor, Professor of Oceanography at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. He is also the Senior Scientist Emeritus at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in the Republic of Panama. His current research includes the long-term impacts of human activities on the oceans, coral reef ecology, and the ecological and evolutionary consequences of the gradual formation of the Isthmus of Panama. Dr. Jackson's accomplishments are far too numerous to count, but they include the Secretary's Gold Medal for Exceptional Service of the Smithsonian Institution, the UCSD Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Science and Engineering, and the International Award for Research in Ecology and Conservation Biology of the BBVA Foundation and Discover Magazine's Outstanding Environmental Achievement Award. More than just an academic researcher, Dr. Jackson is an effective communicator. He has worked tirelessly to spread the message that humans are altering the oceans and has searched for innovative media collaborations to inspire action. At a time where most people choose to ignore declining ocean health, Dr. Jackson has the passion and willingness to speak about such depressing topics and even manages to do so with a touch of humor. It is a true honor to have him here. Please welcome, help me in welcoming Dr. Jackson. Is it on? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dalal. And this, turn this off. Um, whoa. Are we okay? Yeah, we're okay. Um, this is a, a, a really depressing talk. I guess it sort of fits the color of the stone of the buildings here and the, and the climate. Uh, um, and I, I'm very grateful for the fact that it wasn't a sunny day because you all seem decidedly sun-deprived, and uh, I know where you'd be. Uh, um, it, it, it's, it's a really depressing talk. It's, it's essentially a, the story of the unraveling of the oceans as a natural ecosystem and, and the creation of a, of a situation that, frankly, we don't know how it's going to come out. And I guess I should say in the beginning as a card-carrying member of the ecological establishment, as somebody who who made a, a reputation of sorts as a marine ecologist, what the hell were we doing all this time that we didn't really pay attention? It's arguably the case that the ecological profession utterly failed to anticipate the environmental crisis as we recognize it today. And, and to a large extent, that's because we were all uh, off uh, doing the cool stuff that uh, we do that 20 people in the world care about that I prided myself in my first job and uh, when I described what I did uh, with Carl Reefs as saying that I did something that was absolutely no practical significance to anybody. That was a kind of badge we all wore as an indicator of our honor as pure scientists. And, 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 um, and then one day I woke up and I realized that there was not a single place or a single ecosystem that I had studied that hadn't either disappeared, and I mean disappeared, or changed so fundamentally that it was almost recognizable. And I'm only 64 years old, and you know, when I'm 64, will you still need me? I mean, that meant I was 50 when I had this revelation, which meant that in 30 years, the coral reef ecosystems of the Caribbean and the Pacific, the estuarine seagrass communities of places like the Chesapeake Bay, all of these things had either vanished or turned into to, to real disaster areas. And I wanted to know why and, and to think about what to do about it. I mean, the answer why is obvious. Uh, we did it. We're the guilty party. But if you want to go beyond that to ask the question, how could um, people in the wealthiest nation in the world, with the best science in the world, with certainly the best ecology in the world, how could we have missed the boat so incredibly? Um, that's pretty interesting. Uh, I think the, the explanation lies in what the great Daniel Pauly called the shifting baseline syndrome. Daniel is uh, arguably the premier fisheries biologist in the world, and, and fisheries biologists talk about the baseline, which is the stock, the pristine stock of fish before people uh, start to exploit it. And, and, and based on that idea, he, he developed this idea of shifting baselines, which I explain like this. Everybody thinks that natural 
is the way the world was when they were a kid. And natural is all the stuff that happens afterwards as you get older, which is why, as you'll discover, I'm a lot more depressing than most of you. <laughs> but the problem is, as we all know, that children rarely listen to their parents. And so, generation by generation, they make the same mistake. And generation by generation, we lose any sense of what natural means, what McKibben called the, the end of nature. I mean, uh, most people don't know because they don't really have any idea of what nature was. Nature is the shopping mall they went to when they were 12 years old. Um, and so this, this, this amnesia about what is natural, I believe, is the greatest threat to the environment because it, it means we don't know what we've lost. It means we don't know what we could have. It do means we don't have any sense of the value of nature and of natural ecosystems. And I emphasize that I say this from a very anthropocentric point of view. I'm not, this talk is not going to be about tree hugging or fish hugging or any of that. I'm going to talk as if I don't give a damn, which is not true about biodiversity. I'm going to talk about human well-being. And, and, and I suppose a major point of this talk is that even from the selfish point of view of human well-being, we are in deep trouble. And we're in trouble because of this shifting baselines problem. Now, I always like to start with this book, and I always like to ask, how many of you have actually really read Silent Spring? Well, that's not bad. You get maybe about 20%. I would, most universities it's about 5%, which is appalling, because this book is the beginning of the environmental movement in the Western world. This book and Dave Keeling's graph showing the rise of carbon dioxide are the two iconic metaphors of the 20th century environmentalism. And, and Rachel Carson was a great writer. She was conflicted all her life about whether or not she wanted to be a writer or a scientist, and in this book and the sea around us, she achieved both. And she began uh, Silent Spring with what she called a fable for tomorrow, in which she described some idyllic American town, some place like a farm village 20 miles away from here, where everything is apple pie and motherhood and cows and sheep, and really good, and then everything goes wrong. <coughs> and she talks about how sickness appears and everywhere there's a shadow of death. And then she backs off and she says, well, I sort of exaggerated. No one place has had all these things happen in the same place yet, but all of these things have happened. And if we don't get our act together, then they are going to all happen in one place and it is going to be like a fable for tomorrow. Well, I can tell you a story for today, not tomorrow about an estuary where everything is perfect, where there's incredibly abundant fish and the water is clear and, and it's a great place to go and swim and there's whales and there's sea turtles and oyster reefs and seagrass beds and all that good stuff. And then that place changes to a place with dirty, cruddy water with almost no oxygen in the water and fish kills and very poor fisheries and no seagrasses and no oyster reefs and in replace just a whole lot of nutrients and microbes and jellyfish and disease. And the difference between my story and Rachel Carson's story is that that estuary exists. That estuary, that disgusting estuary, is every large estuary in North America. Chesapeake Bay, San Francisco Bay, Pamlico Sound. It's all the large estuaries in Europe. It's all the large estuaries in Asia. It's all, almost every large estuary around the world. Hudson's Bay, because it's frozen over, hasn't quite gotten there yet, but we're, we're doing our best. And it's now. You know, not something that might happen in the future. It's now. And I could tell you similarly depressing stories for today about virtually every ecosystem in the ocean. And of course, uh, there's not a whole lot of awareness. I mean, we have Ben and Jerry's ice cream, right? Because it's going to save the tropical rainforest. At, at the very least, that means that people know tropical rainforests have a problem. There isn't a Ben and Jerry's ice cream to save coral reefs. I mean, this is off the radar screen. This is not something that people pay attention to. Now, if you think back what Rachel Carson was trying to do, 
She was taking on the dark side of the force, right? She took on little family businesses like DuPont. And, and, and she knew they were going to go after her, and they did go after her. So she knew that every single word in Silent Spring had to be right. She knew that she could not screw up because they'd kill her if, if she did. And so if you, if you deconstruct that book, it's really simple and fascinating. The whole book is two questions. What's going on that's new, different, and scary? And then the second question is, what's going to happen if we don't start to, to do something about these new, different, and scary things? So what this talk is about is to do exactly what Rachel Carson did. To ask, first of all, what's new, different, and scary in the oceans? And that'll take about 15 or 20 minutes, and it's really depressing. And then to talk about some of the possible scenarios of what will happen if we don't fix it. And from my point of view, these are the six new, different, and scary things that are going on. We are eliminating every living thing in the oceans bigger than this. I mean, whales, goodbye. Seals, goodbye. Dolphins, tuna, swordfish, sailfish, goodbye. We're reducing it to sardines. At the same time, because of the way we fish, we're turning the forests that used to live on the floor of the ocean into a parking lot. We're just <laughs> leveling the ocean. We're introducing species. We're warming and acidifying the ocean. We're turning it into Coca-Cola. We're poisoning the ocean. And then the rise of slime, which is, is what I call eutrophication. But you have to admit that it would be a great name of a rock group, if nothing else. And, 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 and you know, you say eutrophication, you go to sleep. You say rise of slime, you say, oh, that's interesting. You know? <laughs> so you'll see slime. OK, now this comes from the work of Daniel Pauly um, through Vili Christensen as this amazing see around us group at the University of British Columbia. This is about 25 years work looking at historical fishing records for the whole North Atlantic. The bright red uh, nearby where you guys live, here, this was the richest fishing ground in the history of the world. There were two, or the way you, depending on how you count, either two or three world wars fought about the cod from this area. It was the most valuable global natural commodity after sugar for a couple of centuries. Uh, bacalao is the staple of all of Latin America, and et cetera, et cetera. An extraordinarily abundant fishery, 11 means more than 11 tons per kilometer square per year of fish. That's 1900, that's today, okay? 1900, today. The European Union, in its wisdom, is still discussing whether or not the situation is dire enough here to actually institute some reforms in fishing practice. Um, this is the one thing that Europe has managed to do that makes the Bush administration look environmentalist. <laughs> okay, uh, Ram Myers, who just died, these data come from that well-known environmental organization, the Japanese longline fishing industry. These are industrial data. Uh, I don't know if you know what longline fishing is. Imagine a big, huge ship, 200 feet long. Imagine about 100 lines that are extended out 20 miles. Imagine about half a million hooks on every line. Imagine putting out those millions of hooks every day. And you, you go out and you troll and you come back and you pull it in. And in the beginning when you do that, when you go to a cool place, you get 10 fish for every 100 hooks. But very soon you only get one fish for every 100 hooks. These are all the major oceans of the world, in the open ocean and in the shelf, and they all show the same thing, from 10 fish per 100 hooks to one fish per 100 hooks. Here it is globally, red is good again, white is bad again, and you can see that even by the 1980s, uh, there was no place left in the ocean except down here, and we're pretty <coughs> rapidly eliminating this where there's any red. In other words, no big fish left in the ocean. Now this was a huge headline, Myers and Worm, 2003, 90% of all the big fish in the global ocean are gone. Uh, people have been fighting about it, fisheries biologists, industry people, 
And, and, and when you ask them, well, what was the number? And they say 70% or something. You say, well, isn't 70% bad? And, and, uh, okay. Now, these data, um, these are related to, to Middlebury. Lauren McClenahan was a student here uh, about six years ago. This is from the beginnings of her doctoral dissertation. This reflects two years of work in the archives of the Indies and in, in Sevilla and all sorts of other historical stuff. This is about green turtles. Green turtles are, are cows of the ocean. They used to weigh about 1,000 pounds. They eat something strangely enough called turtle grass. Uh, the big circles indicate places where Lauren has been able to show that the nesting population was on the order of five to seven million thousand pound animals. Uh, there were a lot of places like that. The smaller circles are places where there were fewer. No matter how we jiggle the numbers, we cannot come up with less than 50 million. The number is somewhere between 50 and 100 and 50 million of these half ton animals. That's more biomass of animal than all the bison in North America before the arrival of the horse and the rifle. That's more biomass than all the mammals in Africa. That's a lot of turtles. One species, they <laughs> ate turtle grass. Turtle grass beds now look like hay fields. They used to look like the putting greens of golf courses. Turtle grass now gets sick because of a fungus that colonizes the blades, the old parts of the blades that were never there before. The entire ecology of the turtle grass ecosystem is changed because here is the abundance today, less than 300,000 individuals, okay? And all of them in just a few places and the big circles represent places that have more than 500 nesting individuals rather than more than 5 million individuals. That's a pretty big change. Now, we are a fundamentally anti-historical society, and if you can't see it, we don't believe it. So there are these few places in the world that we can think of as time machines that are incredibly important because since they were forgotten, they are very similar to the way the world used to be. And one of those time machines is the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, where for a long while the Navy would sink you if you went there, and, and that's good for biodiversity. So, <laughs> In the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, there's two and a half times more fish per unit area than there is in the main Hawaiian Islands where, you know, there's all those people. Um, but the thing that's really amazing is there's almost no big predators in the main islands. But in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, more than 50% of the biomass is apex predators, sharks, big, huge predatory fish. The ecological pyramid is upside down. How could that be, right? I mean, we're all taught in, in ecology class that the pyramid is right side up because of the second law of thermodynamics and metabolic inefficiency and all that good stuff. Now, that overlooks something, obviously, because in fact, that's, that's, that's not the way it is. I'll come back to that at the end of the talk, but it's a really neat example of how studying screwed up environments makes basic science wrong. This book, which is a really good popular introduction to the thinking of ecologists, um, Paul answers his title question, why big fierce animals are rare, by talking about the second law of thermodynamics. But that's not the answer. Big fierce animals are rare because we ate them. <laughs> okay, now destruction of of benthic <laughs> habitats. This is because of trawling. So imagine that 200-foot ship or a 100-foot ship. Imagine taking something like an old steam locomotive. Attach it to a chain that could lift up, you know, a skyscraper and drag the locomotive across the bottom. Or to make it more realistic, think about a sequel to Escape from New York where you have a big, huge military helicopter dangling this locomotive from a chain flying through Manhattan, sort of knocking the tops off of all the buildings. That's trawling. That's how we fish the bottom of the ocean. And it turns it into a parking lot. So here's a, a deep water coral forest before, and that's after one trawling. And most of the continental shelf of the world ocean looks like this. This is an amazing picture, I think. You can see the furrows, right? You can see the lines. My colleagues at Scripps cannot leave a geophysical instrument on the seafloor for 24 hours 
because $50,000 will disappear right there, boom, every day, because the seafloor is constantly being trawled. And we don't have good numbers. I've been working on this for a while, but it looks like the amount of area of the seafloor that has been turned into a parking lot is comparable to the area, area on the land of all the forests ever cut down by humanity in the history of humanity. But hey, out of sight, out of mind, right? Okay. I, and so as a consequence of all the different kind of fishing, this again comes from Daniel Pauly and his great idea of fishing down the food web. You know, we, we used to like to eat all these great predators. That's like eating lions and tigers, right? Lions and tigers in the ocean taste good. They taste bad on the land. When I do geological field work, sometimes I'm served monkey and it doesn't taste very good. I know it's also really offensive, but mostly it doesn't taste very good. But in the ocean, lions and tigers taste really good, you know? And, 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 but we, we got rid of them, so now we're down to sardines, which I think also taste good and are more ecological, and the forest that was on the seafloor is gone. So fishing has turned this into this, and it's done on, on a global scale. Introduced species, you probably all know about killer bees. One of the things global warming is going to do is give us Africanized bees in Vermont. Uh, I lived with them for 20 years in Panama. It's not that scary, but they do every once in a while kill somebody. Um, and then there's kudzu, and there's fire ants, and uh, these are things that cost, they're the, arguably the biggest cost, the biggest pest cost for American agriculture are introduced species. You know, they stop you at the border in California to search your car to see whether or not you're bringing in plants because people will lose billions of dollars. This is the infamous killer algae. There's a book called Killer Algae. Um, it was introduced from the Monaco Aquarium into the northwestern Mediterranean. It's very pretty, right? Bright green, it's used in an aquaria. Nothing eats it because it came from somewhere else. It is carpeting the entire northwestern Mediterranean down to a depth of something like 50 meters. It transforms communities of invertebrates with one to 2,000 species into communities of 50 to 100 species. It's just, it's like you, did you, if you ever saw the movie The Little Shop of Horrors, this is the plant in The Little Shop of Horrors, <laughs> and it is overgrowing the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, now warming and acidification. I mean, how could we have had an argument? You know, I mean, look at this picture. Just 24 years. You remember the Northwest Passage? You remember all those brave dudes that went to try and find a passageway between the Atlantic and the Pacific? Well, it's opening up. It's on the Siberian coast. They'll charge the tolls to go through the new Arctic Canal. In the business section of La Prensa in Panama two years ago, I read one of the best articles I've ever read about global warming. Should we spend 10 to 15 billion dollars to widen the Panama Canal now? Does it make sense? Or is this going to put us out of business? The answer is it's still worth it. They'll still make money. The insurance companies are going to be very nervous about this for 20 years. So Panama can get rich for a little while longer. But I mean, these things have, I think it's very interesting that, that you know, business people saw the, the implications of this a long time ago. Of course, uh, ecologists worry about polar bears and stuff like that. All that will be gone in 100 years. Read uh, that wonderful book by Elizabeth Colbert, Field Notes from a Catastrophe. Greenland is going much faster than we ever imagined was possible. The entire Arctic ecosystem is, is gone, right? I mean, it's, it's, we better study it now because it's not going to be there. Uh, we'll come back to polar bears. I think there's a future for polar bears. Um, species ranges are, are galloping towards the north. Coral reefs are suffering from this phenomenon of coral bleaching I'll talk about briefly. And the oceans are becoming acid. And that's just really an amazing concept. I mean, what's the icon of going to the beach, right? Seashells on the beach. Imagine a world ocean where there are no seashells on the beach because the seashells dissolve because the ocean is acidic. So this is bleaching, right? Um, corals, uh, th th this is sort of a happy and unhappy mix of corals. 
and the brown color comes from the symbionts, right? You probably all know about this stuff. The so-called zooxanthellae, which are many different kinds of dinoflagellates that live inside the coral tissue. And it, it, it's, it's, people call it a symbiosis, but it's really, the better term is mutualism. And, and mutualisms are not friendly, uh, sort of hugging relationships. Mutualisms are like, the relationship between the United States and Russia in 1944. You hate each other's guts, you know you can't trust each other, but there's something out there that's worse. And so you're gonna deal with that, but you know, don't ever cross me, because if you cross me, I'm gonna screw you. And so the mutualism of the corals operates that these creatures give the corals sugar. And in return, the corals give these things nutrients and a place to live. Well, when it gets warm, they can't make sugar. They don't give sugar to the corals. The coral says, the hell with you, you're cheating, kicks out the algae and dies, which is, uh, they haven't quite figured out that part of it. There's a, uh, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of interesting biology here. There are many different kinds of symbionts. Uh, there's actually hope uh, for this. I think all corals won't disappear. Uh, they'll just mostly disappear for a very long time, and you better go scuba diving on coral reefs now, because uh, uh, it's, it couldn't be too soon. Um, the, look at that picture. It's beautiful, right? That's on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, it's beautiful, except that it's, what you're looking at is death, because the white coral skeleton means that all those little symbionts that give the coral color have been kicked out. So that's, that's something. Imagine if you went camping on the 4th of July here. You've got trees with leaves, right? You don't have just pine trees here, right? So you go camping, and, and, and you wake up on the, on the morning, and you look around you, and 80% of all the trees have dropped their leaves. And you say, whoa. And you come back here and you watch, turn on the tube, and you discover that 80% of all the trees in North America have dropped their leaves. And so you, you get sort of worried, and a month later you see a little article on page 22, section 1 of the New York Times saying that a quarter of all those trees had died. So in other words, 20% of all the trees in North America had died because of something that happened on the 4th of July. Well, that's what happened in the Indian Ocean in 1998, an area as big as North America, when 80% of all the corals bleached and a quarter of those died. And did you read about it? No. Okay, poisoning of food webs. I'm not gonna show you a picture of this because it's so disgusting uh, to show you the pictures. So I'll just tell you, that's disgusting enough. Um, when we burn coal, in power plants in North America, and the stuff goes up in the air, it gets shunted to the Arctic. That's just the way it works. And when it gets to the Arctic, it comes down. And so it, it, all of the stuff that we don't take out of the emissions from the plant, including a lot of mercury, okay? That mercury gets into the food web in the Arctic, and it goes up the food chain. And as a result, by the time you get to, you know, killer whales and dolphins and seals and people and large predatory fish, you have incredible reductions in reproduction, in growth rate, in survival, etc. Now, keeping in the vein of people, an Eskimo woman's breast milk would qualify as a toxic waste dump by EPA standards because of the mercury and other stuff that they have consumed from eating their traditional diet of marine mammals. Okay. Think about that. Okay, wild salmon. And now, you know, I'm post-reproductive, so I don't care about this stuff. I mean, but looking out on all you young women's faces, you should think about this a lot. Um, wild salmon, you know, the good stuff the stuff that you're supposed to buy because it's not farmed and evil. Um, there was a little one-page article in Nature about three or four years ago about Alaskan wild salmon. They go up the rivers, they spawn, they die the way they're supposed to, the eagles and the raccoons come and eat them, and they're so full 
of toxic garbage that this stuff goes through the entire terrestrial food chain in this pristine Alaskan Valley. And then finally, if you knew what was in farm salmon, you would not eat it. Because what is farm salmon? Farm salmon, salmon is a lion or a tiger. We're farming lions. What are we feeding the lions we're eating? We're feeding them fish meal. Where did we get the fish meal? From the ocean. How did we get it? We got it by trawling. We get all this stuff, we pump it into a factory, we make an utterly disgusting soup, and out it comes as little clean pellets like what you'd give your dog in a brightly colored, beautiful, eco-labeled package, which is 40% protein, with all of the contaminants that were in the North Sea or wherever that fish was obtained. Okay, rise of slime. Why does a swimming pool get dirty? It gets dirty either because, you know, we're, the filter breaks or we're sort of a slob and we let, you know, all the dirt get in the pool. Environmentalists, when they look at the problem of eutrophication, the, the, the increased productivity, hyperproductivity in, in the ocean, worry about the, the, the increased input of, of nutrients and they forget about the filter. But, you know, nature gave us a free filter. For example, this mountain is oyster shells. It's one of hundreds of mountains of oyster shells that circled the Chesapeake Bay at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. The reason the hills aren't there, tragically, is not because they threw the shells back in the water, which would have been great. They're not there because this is biologically pure lime, and so it was all ground up for medicinal purposes. Oysters filtered the equivalent of the Chesapeake Bay every three to five days, actually probably more like every one to two days. Oysters invented the millipore filter. They cleaned that water. That was a free service which is gone. Okay, and, and, and but I mean also there's the input. So what are the manifestations of the rise of slime? What are the manifestations of getting rid of the filters and also all these nutrients that are going into the water? Dead zones, I'll talk about those. Toxic algal blooms, disease of marine organisms, and outbreaks of human disease. This is a huge problem. Okay, dead zones aren't dead, actually. They're bacteria, which is what makes this water green, and jellyfish, which can eat them. It's the microbial loop. It's I could go into this for a very long period of time, but this is in what used to be a very rich shrimping and, and fishing ground, redfish ground, off of the mouth of the Mississippi River. And in the Northwest Atlantic, where all the cod were, where the 35,000 people lost their jobs in 82 when the cod <laughs> collapsed, the Canadian government, as a program of environmental relief, is trying to develop a jellyfish fishery where the cod used to swim. And here you see an example of the jellyfish fishery, and we are not far from seeing jellyfish as one of the major seafood products in the world. They're crunchy, you know, they're, they're okay. <laughs> now, now this picture, the Mississippi River is up here. The Texas-Mexico border is down here. This beautiful little creature, this dinoflagellate, is having a population explosion. <coughs> it's having a population explosion on the scale of what? The entire northwestern Gulf of Mexico. It's exploding on a scale equal to the size of New England. It's a toxic bloom. It kills fish. <coughs> and this picture, this is my favorite. We, we, we did this thing, uh, this shifting baselines media program thing I do. We, di we did this thing we called Hollywood Ocean Night. And we had all these movie stars, and we, you know, how do you relate to a movie star? It, 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 or how, how are you going to get them to relate to you? It's sort of, so, so I said, why don't you Im w imagine acting in a movie called Escape from Malibu? You know where Malibu is? It's where all the rich people live. It's where uh, Mel Gibson got arrested for drunken driving. And, 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 and Escape from Malibu, where all the rich people go and live in South Dakota because Malibu is so unhealthy, and the only people who live in Malibu are the, the street people who can't afford to go to South Dakota. 
And I thought, oh my God, Jeremy, you've gone too far. This is really too much. Here it is, and the only thing is it's Florida instead of Malibu. So this is, you know, Gold Coast of Florida. This is where people who live in these houses have come to retire. They lived in New Jersey or Vermont all their lives. They were cold. They were miserable. <laughs> they decided to go to Florida. Uh, they spent all their life savings, and they live on the beach by paradise. And look at this. I mean, doesn't it look evil? Okay, so here's this. This is the same creature as that. Okay? Here it is coming ashore. There's a little bit of a breeze. Droplets of water get into the air. The droplets of water are carried onto the shore. And within 12 hours, the emergency rooms of all the hospitals in the region are full of people with acute asthma attacks and all sorts of allergic reactions and immunological breakdown. And you name it, people leave their homes, they close the schools, they close the stores, and they wait for the black death to go away. I mean, it's happening. Uh, this is the equivalent thing in Moreton Bay in Australia, where Brisbane is. Beautiful place. Uh, Fisteria. This is when all the fish in an estuary decide to spill their guts on the beach, right? That's caused by another dying. These creatures are the enemy. <laughs> And, and Fisteria is just really amazing. Uh, Carl disease is another manifestation of the rise of slime. Okay, so I've gone through all this stuff. When we first published it all, we got in, we got a lot of attacks from the Lombergs of this world saying, you fudged your data. The way you did this was you went out and you find the worst examples. So in effect, we spent, I think, wasted three years of our lives showing that wherever there's any data, if you go there and look, the same story is there over and over. So I'm going to go through this very quickly, but we looked at 12 estuaries and coastal seas around the world, 14 coral reef systems around the world. Um, uh, we used very unconventional data because we were interested in changes over long periods of time. So this is fossils, archaeology, history. Uh, you could never publish this in ecology. That's why you have to publish it in a journal. Uh, like science, because it's not <laughs> acceptable to the standards of ecologists, I guess. And, and, and the story is just amazing. For, 14, uh, for 12 estuaries, mammals uh, declining over time, birds. So the first, that's pristine. Then hunter-gatherer stage. Then early subsistence agriculture. Then sort of colonial development and trade. And then the modern era. So the time scale is relative based on economics. And all the things we like going down the drain. Mammals, birds, fish, <coughs> reptiles, invertebrates, and plants. You can do it by functional groups, in other words, carnivores, herbivores, etc., all going down. Stuff we don't like, all going up, invasive species. Uh, degradation of water quality. This is based on very detailed chemistry from cores, uh, getting worse and worse. So for the global estuarine coastal sea systems, all the things we value, declining, all the things that are trouble increasing. It's a global picture. It's the norm. Okay. Rachel Carson's second question. Remember, she had a second question. Here we get into what I think is the most important part of this talk, you know, because as scientists, we're not supposed to speculate. We're, only, we're supposed to refine the obituary of nature and then say, yep, that's what I thought was going to happen. <coughs> Instead of having the, the guts to say, you know, the sky is falling, let's actually do something now. So, so what's going to happen? I think we can represent it by a, oh, damn. This projector is going to ruin this. Um, I haven't figured out why this happens. But there used to be a lot of big animals. We got them. There used to be a lot of structure. Uh, that stuck around long enough, and this is slime increasing. And I'm going to skip over this because it's not going to work. But you see it in this picture. Here's the same story. So the oceans used to be like this. Now the ocean, this is for coral reefs in the Caribbean. Now they look like this. I began my career somewhere around here. The, the kids I taught at Johns Hopkins got to see this. The people I teach at Scripps get to see this. People pay $500 to go scuba diving in, in Belize or, or Jamaica, and they see this. 
And the people who got them milk them for $500. They're not stupid. So they take them to a place where they see a whole lot of really beautiful little sponges and tidy, tiny little brightly colored angelfish. And the people come out of the water practically having an orgasm. And they say, oh my god, oh my god, I saw a coral reef. It's so beautiful, right? And what they've seen is this. And I just don't dive anymore. And, and this is the question. We know this has happened, and we have no idea what to do about that. Okay. Now, since this is so depressing, I'm going to give you this much hope. Um, we went on one of the – it actually dragged me out of the lab and put me in the water again. We went to the center of the Pacific to these islands, the Northern Line Islands. And the reason we went there is because we had heard that they were like the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. You know, Captain Cook discovered Karitamati. He called it Christmas Island in the late 18th century. Um, it was uninhabited. All these islands were uninhabited. People had come off and on. Um, there was never enough there to be really worthwhile except the guano, which got ripped off and then people left. There were a bunch of American sailors here uh, in the Second World War, but they didn't do too much damage and left. So, so there are these places in the middle of nowhere and also these islands. And I'm showing you this color because, you know, whenever we do something wrong, we always blame it on something else than us. So we would blame it on oceanography. And I'm going to show you that these islands are totally destroyed. <coughs> and these islands are really still in very good shape. And there are a lot of people on these islands, and there's almost no people on these islands. And, and whatever, all the oceanographers say, well, it's obvious the reason these islands are, are in really bad shape is because the oceanography is different. And I'm going to show you that has nothing to do with it. But that's what we do. There are people who are seriously arguing that the reason cod have declined in the Northeast Atlantic is because of global climate change. The fact that we ate the cod had nothing to do with it. <laughs> it was due to global climate change. So ocean, that's why that oceanography is there. Okay. But if you look at all the islands, not just these, but all the islands in this part of the Central Pacific, and you ask the question, how much uh, fish is there versus uh, how much people there are, it's a pretty clear picture of the fact that when you have a lot of people, you don't have a lot of fish. And when you have very few people, you do have a lot of fish, which demonstrates scientifically that uh, really difficult concept that when you don't kill fish, there are more fish. <laughs> okay, so going to those islands to the center of the Pacific, and there are these four places, Kingman, zero people, Palmyra, Gordon Moore bought Palmyra for $17 million and gave it to the Nature Conservancy who gave it to Fish and Wildlife. Gordon Moore is a really cool guy. He's, if you have intel inside, that's where he got his money. And then Tabarayan, 2,500, and Christmas Island, 5,100 people. This is the second largest atoll in the world. It has only 5,100 people. Think of that when you see what it looks like. Okay, so that's, that's Kingman, zero people. And I can tell you that's the first time I really got turned on when I went diving for 20 years. Every time you get in the water, you see at least 25 sharks. And there are other fish in that picture, but they're neurotic, right? <laughs> and so they're, they're, they're down in the coral, and you can see there's a forest of coral. It looks pretty cool, right? And uh, the coral's beautiful, just beautiful. This is in 2005, in the era of global warming, when corals are bleaching and the end is coming, and there's no hope, there's no future. But they didn't know that in Kingman, so they're, they're still there. Okay, this is Christmas Island, 5,100 people. Notice the abundant fish community, and look at the rich coral assemblage. Okay, 5,100 people. But in 1777, people rowing their 25-foot wooden boat ashore. On every side of us swam sharks innumerable and so voracious that they bit our oars and rudder and I actually stuck my hanger. That's an enormous <coughs> boat hook. Uh, two inches into the back of one while he had the rudder between his teeth. All the descriptions of going ashore in these islands in the 18th century and in the 19th century of the sharks attack the boat. Don't go in in a little boat because they'll knock over the boat and they'll eat you. It, I made my career uh, as a coral reef ecologist scuba diving in the water. I would have been lunch if I'd tried to be a diving coral reef ecologist in the 18th century. I mean, even in places like that that look so cool, right? 
That's a totally screwed up ecosystem. There are no tiger sharks. There are no 20-foot sharks that would eat me for lunch. It looks amazing, but it's altered. Okay, and then, so here's the coral community, and there are a few little living corals in there somewhere. And these data show the same thing, you know, uh, where you don't have any people, you have lots of fish. And look at that, 85% of all the biomass is sharks and top predatory fish. The pyramid is even more upside down in Kingman than it was in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Uh, Carl covers the same. I'm, I'm going to zoom through this. And on the other hand, you get all of these, uh, what does that say, um, bacteria and virus-like particles and protists. So all the, you, lots of bad stuff in the island with 5,000 people. Now, 5,100 people cannot make enough poop and pee to explain this. This is not because of pollution. They don't have any industry. They don't have any agriculture. They don't have any fertilizer. It's a really interesting, complicated story why that, why that happens. And it's related to the fact that if you have, uh, I can't see, the number of viruses and the number of bacteria are positively related with each other. The viruses are feeding off of the bacteria. There's this, this terrible feedback loop going on, and it all relates to the leakage of organic matter out of the seaweed. Okay, There's, the good news is coral bleaching, warm events, there were terrible bleaching events in Kingman and Palmyra, and in spite of that, there's all that coral. Why? Because there's lots of recruitment of new babies in those places, and there's much less coral disease. In the places than in the places that are overfished, that have virtually no recruitment and lots of disease. Something about fishing, something about local disturbance affects the ability of the community to respond to global change. In other words, the, the communities in the unfished, uh, unimpacted areas are more resilient to climate change. So, in effect, what's going on in this place in the middle of the Pacific is in the unaffected area, there's lots of fish. And they're feeding on algae. There's not many viruses and bacteria. And the benthic community is dominated by corals. Whereas when you get to Christmas Island, there's very little fish. There's almost no corals. The bottom is dominated by algae. The algae leak <laughs> organic matter. The organic matter feeds the bacteria. The bacteria feed the viruses. And so you have a system which is utterly, totally different. And yet most people think all that organic matter is due to poop, but it has nothing to do with poop at all. Okay, so the summary is there is good news. Protection from fishing. Whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> Protection from fishing and pollution confers resilience against global change um, uh, and, and to disease. And the bad news is, is all it takes is 5,100 people. Okay, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so the world ocean used to be like this. There were a lot of fish, there were a lot of consumers, there were a lot of all this three-dimensional stuff is what's down here. The shading indicates organisms that built structure, that made forests. The little f <coughs> equals filters. So lots of fish, not many people, not many nutrients, not many microbes, not many jellyfish. All the good stuff dominated the ocean. Today, the global ocean is like this. There's a ton of people trying to catch the last fish in the ocean. There are almost no consumers, all the stuff we used to like to eat. There's almost no three-dimensional stuff. There's microbes, there's jellyfish, and there's nutrients. This is what's called the microbial loop. The things we like feed on what's called the grazing food chain instead of the microbial loop. That's a, our lecture about the balance of power between these two different food chains in the ocean, suffice it to say, we have kicked the ocean into the wrong food chain. And why do we still <coughs> catch the last fish left? A single bluefin tuna, not much bigger than me, never frozen, flown in a helicopter, put in a jet plane, delivered to Tokyo at 3 o'clock in the morning, is $150,000 cash in the auction that morning to, to be distributed to sushi bars where a serving cost $200. And with that, at $150,000 of fish, people will fish. Okay, so what are we doing in summary? We're destroying habitats and the modification of the ocean 
of destroying the habitats is causing these huge reductions in entire suites of organisms to the point that they become ecologically extinct. It doesn't matter whether they're extinct or not. They're ecologically, they have no meaning. The virtual elimination of the formerly dominant species is providing opportunities for the expansion of all sorts of other species. Think rats and cockroaches. And then the newly established associations are stabilized because you know it's like king of the mountain. Once you're on the top of the mountain, it's really hard to get you off. I know that doesn't sound very scientific, but the entire theory of the nonlinear dynamics of ecosystems is essentially the story of king of the mountain. And here is, there's not much science in this. It's mostly economics, behavior, consumption, etc. But there is some science, and this to me is the most exciting science. Imagine you take all of the complexity of the world and you reduce it to two dimensions in if what you know what an ordination is, is in an ordination. And so being on the left of the diagram is good and being on the right is bad. And things are getting worse and they're moving towards bad. And so you get to this point. You say, oh my goodness, I should do something about this. And, and so you, you try and stop all the bad stuff that's going on. You think that what's going to happen is the green arrow. I fixed it, it'll go back to the way it was. That's not going to happen most of the time. The best you can probably hope for is that it'll sort of random walk around where you got it to. And the nightmare is that it'll keep getting worse because you didn't fix the right thing. In the United States, we say, oh, we don't know what'll happen, so we won't do anything. That's American environmental policy. In Australia, they say, uh, we don't know whether it's going to work, but we're so proud of the Great Barrier Reef that we're going to take one-third of the Great Barrier Reef and make it completely off-limits for all kinds of activities forever and ever. That's like taking the entire east coast of the United States from Canada to Key West and saying one-third is off-limits. Do they know whether it's going to work? No. But they've got guts, right? Uh, it's a missing item. So to finish up, what kinds of organisms will inhabit the extreme right-hand side of the picture? Because this is the future ocean. Get used to it. Okay, and, and, and to do that, I forgot to do my little introduction to this, but you know, this guy was a hero, or Orwell, my real hero, but 1984 doesn't work as a title. What did these people do? They sat back, they looked at the world the way it was, and they said, I see trouble ahead, right? And so they wrote these amazing books that affected our lives. And I don't know about you, but 1984 is alive and well uh, in, in, in the world today. And I love this. A book to be read again and again and to ponder before oblivion comes. So I hope you do that as a function of this talk. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you three, three scenarios. And they're really depressing, and then we're done. Okay, this is scenario one. And this is the best we could possibly hope for, and it's just, it ain't going to happen. But the ocean remains mixed and oxygenated, okay? So the ocean doesn't run out of oxygen because it's mixed. Overfishing causes mass extinction of virtually all the big organisms in the ocean. And the dominance and, and, and radiation of opportunistic species, think dandelions, sardines, weeds of various kinds, okay? This is the best we can hope for if we reverse or stabilize overfishing and nutrient runoff and control carbon emissions, all of those things in the next couple of decades, right? Think that's going to happen? Uh, I don't know. You know, the green revolution is the real reason for the rise of slime. Feeding people, which gave us six billion people that put all that fertilizer in the ocean, that's why the oceans are undergoing the rise of slime. We have to eat, so it's going to be hard to stop doing that. Scenario two, the ocean becomes stratified and anoxic like the Black Sea. The Black Sea is a big place. There's no oxygen on the bottom. It's all hydrogen sulfide like rotten eggs on the surface. Um, it's got oxygen, and there used to be fish in it until people uh, did all the overfishing. But so, and why would the entire global ocean stratify? It'll stratify because it's getting warm, and warmer water doesn't sink, and you break off the conveyor belt. You break the connection. A lot of my colleagues are making models right now saying, when is the ocean going to stratify? Not will it stratify, but when will it stratify? Maybe it won't. Maybe it will. Uh, if it does, there won't be any oxygen in the deep ocean, but there'll still be oxygen in the surface. That's the way the Earth was about a billion and a half years ago. 
uh, before the rise of oxygen. And there was life, uh, sort of a sort. But overfishing, we'll still have the weeds. We won't have anything in the deep sea. And that's the best we can hope for if we control the fishing and the, and the agriculture, but we didn't solve the global warming problem. And you know where the third category is going to be, and that is that there's no fish left in the ocean. There's the, the surface of the ocean is the dead zone, and the bottom of the ocean is an anoxic black sea because we stratified it. Now, you know, this isn't just a matter of whether you eat fish sticks. This is, this is a, a, a matter of, um, this is, this is a matter of the way we live and what we consume, and it's very pervasive and it's very global. And it's not, unfortunately, it's not as easily addressable as a lot of the things that I know people talk about here a great deal, about how you live locally and do all those things. I mean, those help, but unfortunately, there's this huge gap and distance in just imagining, you know, the oceans are out of sight and out of mind, and it's very hard when you go to a Costco and you buy fish, which is still cheap, to believe that fish overfishing is a problem. But if you look, read the fine print, if you shot, I don't know, do they allow Costco's in the People's <laughs> Republic of Vermont? I, 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 I don't know, but if you, you go and look, you know, I mean, they come from the Benguela Current. They come from West Africa because somebody bought off the Minister of the Interior of some country in West Africa, which allows them to us to steal all the fish from West Africa and sell it still cheap, you know, and so the people there don't have the fish. I, so, it, you know, we're living in this sense that everything's still good, but it is hugely global. Who will you see at the beach? What will be the creatures that will live there? There'll be the dandelions. They'll be the things we choose to farm, right? Because that's the way of the future. Tilapia is already more than half the fish consumed in the world. That's okay. It's healthy. It doesn't taste like anything. So <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose that's okay. They will be the equivalent of the cows in the ocean. We will domesticate the oceans. It's pretty stupid in the 21st century to live by hunting and gathering, right? I mean, that's what fishing is. It's hunting and gathering. It's not ranching. Uh, but you do have to think about whether or not you want to eat the stuff that was farmed in the ocean that's full of the mercury. So that's a little problem. And then there'll be the marine equivalents of the rats and cockroaches, which will become the unanticipated major pests. If you lived on the Great Lakes, you'd know about zebra mussels that are filling the Great Lakes. Canada geese, those beautiful birds that fly by here, they're feeding in the winter in the, in, in the mid-Atlantic states on corn. They're going north in, in numbers ten times greater than what they were, and they are destroying the entire salt marsh ecosystem of Hudson's Bay at a rate equivalent to a Rhode Island per year. There won't be any salt marshes left there in a decade. That's beautiful Canada geese. Herring gulls, you all know why they're abundant. It's called garbage. And polar bears, what about those polar bears? I have this vision of polar bears being like grizzly bears in Yellowstone, these sort of gigantic raccoon rats or something that will terrorize the people of the newly melting Arctic communities going around the garbage dumps of the Arctic unless we, we sort of take them out. But there's a, there's a future for polar bears. <laughs> the world ocean is going to be different. There's no way we can make it not be different. The question is whether or not this suite of creatures will include some things we might like to have around or not. Thanks very much. I'm sorry, I took too long. You just uh, two announcements before you leave. If you're not too depressed, there's a discussion here at 4.30. There'll be brownies to drown your sorrows with. Um, <laughs> and I have uh, three seafood watch cards for anyone that wants them. I'll put them in the back. Are you willing to take a couple sure. questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, what do you think of the work of the Marine Stewardship Council to pursue sustainable fisheries? Uh -huh. Uh, do you want me to speak as a WWF board member? <laughs> I think that it's a good idea. 
I think that there's huge accountability issues as to whether or not we should really believe that that stuff is stuff we should eat or whether or not it's sustainable. There's arguably one and only one sustainable fishery in the U.S., and that's the, on a big scale, and that's the Alaska Pollock fishery, and, you know, it better be sustainable because Senator Stevens is still Senator Stevens. Um, it may be. Um, it's the right thing to do. Um, the same program for sustainable forestry, I think, really works. But I think the oceans are in such terrible trouble. You know, it's like all these programs, we get these really idealistic students who come into our marine biodiversity and conservation program. A lot of them went off to help develop marine protected areas in places like the Philippines. Marine protected areas are wonderful things, but if 5,000 people are too many people for Christmas Island, there's no way you can divide the loaves of bread like Christ, you know? I mean, there's the, the ecosystem will sustain just so much fish, and um, if you're actually going to protect it, then, then a very small number of people are going to be able to get it. It rapidly turns into a luxury food like that bluefin tuna in, in Tokyo, rather than something that sustains those people in the Philippines who really need the protein. So um, I don't think there's any hope for wild fish uh, sustaining people on any realistic scale in the future. I, it makes me cry to say it, but the sooner we get realistic and start doing aquaculture on a massive scale, in, re in the key word, in responsible ways, the better because you just cannot feed people on wild fish. It just, it won't work. Yeah. There seems this, when you talk about the human side of things, there's an implicit correction here, and that is that at some point, a lot of humans are going to die, right? I mean, eventually the food's going to run out. No, I, I, think that, I think the terrible problem is that, you know, have you ever read uh, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells? Oh, God, that is a great book. And, and he goes forward in time, and he gets to a place where humanity has eliminated all a time in the future. When uh, there's two kinds of people on the planet, the Morlocks and the Aloy. And humans have evolved into two species. And one of the driving forces that uh, people in their wisdom have managed to eliminate, even the cattle and the whatever, so there's nothing left to eat except people. And so the Morlocks, who are these subterranean, working class, horrible people, farm the Aloy, who are these elite, aristocratic gazelles, to eat. Okay? I mean, and, 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 and then actually when he finally escapes the Morlocks, he goes even further into the future, and I love this. The world has been reduced to gigantic crabs and slime. So I think H.G. Wells was one of the first great environmentalists. But, but um, you know, we will find a way. People are ingenious. I don't believe for an, I mean, we may disappear because of a super avian flu or something. Uh, we may disappear because of Ice Nine, bless that wonderful man's soul. But, but, but we will not disappear because we're stupid in, in an ingenuity sense. We'll always figure out some way to survive. What the world be like, I'm, that's your problem, not my problem. I won't be here. But, the, but we'll always figure that out. That's the problem. We can run the system down and down and down and down. And because of shifting baselines, we don't even realize we're miserable. Hmm? Yeah. Um, really struck by the, your, your literary illustration, Brave New World, 1984. Um, the Time Machine, all favorites of mine as well. Uh, there are, there's also a body of, of literature that, that can be can be called ecological. I'm thinking, say, uh, Peter Matheson's Parker of Pluto, which is about uh, life, right? The green, the, the green sea turtles in the Caribbean, and, and that fishery is very pessimistic. Uh, the cultural impact of what you've been describing with the degradation of the world's oceans is enormous. We know this in New England, uh, who, who I taught and love. Um, in your travels, in your research, have you noticed, witnessed a great deal of cultural impact? Oh, it's huge. In fact, the, the, the woman I mentioned who went to school here, Lauren McClanahan, her thesis is on the historical ecology of the Florida Keys. 
It's an absolutely extraordinary story. I mean, she's just skimming the cream because it would take 50 years to do it right. There's a whole Cuban connection which she's only just touching on. But um, the last 200 years of the Florida Keys and the ways that people made their livings and the whole social scene that built up in that whole region of South Florida and then things fall apart and, and everything just breaks down. And, and th that it continues to go on anywhere. I think any maritime economy is depressing. I mean, maritime New England is, is really depressing. I mean, and, and, um, and New England built its fortunes on the destruction of one marine resource after another, right? Whales and cod and, 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 and oysters and uh, all those things. Um, it turns out these people, I mean, to be really cynical, it turns out that those people who had that closer connection to nature are already irrelevant. I mean, fishing, for example, fishers are like the Marlboro men of the oceans, you know. They're, so they, they have this romantic image, and so politicians allow themselves to be manipulated by these people in this dying industry. But from a, a business perspective, fishing is already, for example, in California, fishing is not worth as much practically as whale watching. I mean, it, it, it you know, so it's, it's, it's really going down. And people will shed a tear for the loss of an old way of life, but then they'll, they'll, can you say, banalify it in the same kind of way we did the American West and the cowboy who now pushes cigarettes, right? I mean, the, the, I, don't, I don't think we care. I think for the people who suffer, because it's still part of their lives, it's very, very important, but I think we, at least in North America, are so disconnected from that in our shopping mall lives that, that um, we, we can't even imagine it. I don't know if that's a fair answer or not, but I, I, I think one of the most depressing things, perhaps, of the, the end of nature is the loss of even a realization that it's something worth thinking about. You had somebody up there. Not eating lions and tigers would be a good start. Well, you talked about feeding the fish by, by crawling. What, what alternatives? Soybeans. But that's a problem because, you know, soybeans come from the Amazon. Um, you know, you can't feed people without destroying the environment. That's one of those things, right? I mean, you had, um, what's his name here? Oh, God, I'm blind. You had Jared here last, this week, or last, you know, I mean, and, and if you look at all those collapse stories, I mean, basically feeding a lot of people, doing it successfully, uh, that screws up the environment. So it's really just a question of screwing it up as little as possible. And um, since freshwater ecosystems are a thing of the past anyway, um, tilapia is a very, very good option. And tilapia is already providing the major source of protein in huge areas of Asia. And how can one say that's a bad thing? I mean, sure, it's bad for little freshwater cladocerans, but I'm a person, and I guess I value people more than I do freshwater cladocerans. So, I mean, when you make a decision, you can say, well, here is a way to provide a source of food which will be very significant. It will have an impact, but it's not as great as the impact of destroying the oceans. And so you do it. Oysters are good, you know. I mean, mussels are good. They're filter feeders. They, they're very low down on the food chain. They also haven't had a chance to accumulate lots of toxins, so they're healthier to eat that way. Um, mussel farming is huge in Europe, and it's a cheap meal, you know. I mean, oysters aren't so cheap because you have to fuss over them. But, I mean, there's lots of stuff like that that can be done, which is, uh, is wise and, and healthy and nutritious and all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I want to follow up on the Sam and Pete question and really how Christ suffered only gets to get from uh, any of the three any of the, the wildlife contaminants and things like that. So I just want to know is are you currently interested in, in beseeching clients to fight for their pets? So do they are they on the top of do they have to either work to keep the fish or cow based on Sam and Pete's question of what to get out of it? So, so they, are we kind of deluding ourselves and saying, Oh, I only need to change the 
you go to a very elite institution if they actually feed you wild salmon. That, that, yeah, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> what can I say? You are not the, uh, the median of America. <laughs> I mean, you just are not. Uh, wow. I mean, the mind boggles at that. Uh, the, the, and actually, the very notion that you can even afford to do it is somewhat unfortunate because um, – <laughs> No, because, I mean, something like that doesn't have a prayer in hell unless it's, it's a luxury item. You know, I mean, if, it, if, if people can afford to buy massive amounts of, far, of, of wild salmon and put that much pressure on that market, there's no way it's going to be sustainable. It just can't be. I mean, that's a, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? I mean, the, the logic of doing that is great. But if you think it through, the consequence of it is not cool. Um, you know, I, I mean, look at the food chain of the ocean and ask yourself what you think you should be eating from it. And nothing you eat ha is without a footprint. I mean, have you read Fast Food Nation? I mean, whoa, you read Fast Food Nation and you won't eat cattle or chicken again. I mean, so, I mean, everywhere you turn around, you're going to have to live on alfalfa sprouts forever. And they pr there's probably something wrong with that, <laughs> you know? So, so the real answer is to be real and realistic and recognize that there's no manner of food production which doesn't have an ecological footprint, a significant one. And then ask, what's the wisest way to balance that so that you minimize the impact? And just the fact that you're concerned about it is, you know, huge. That's good. But it's, there is no easy answer to that question. I mean, chicken, the chicken farms, the, the huge part of the pollution of the, all the estuaries is chicken shit. You know, it just flows into the bays everywhere. Because they don't have to pay tax on the amount of chicken shit they produce. And it's even worse from the hog farms. They don't have to pay tax on, 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 on the pig excrement. And so, you know, and then the community has to deal with it. And these are factories. Have you ever been? I mean, I'll tell you, you'll become a vegetarian if you go to a pig farm. Because the way we do this now, industrially, is just mind-boggling. So there's nothing that doesn't have a footprint. <coughs> yeah. I, I think I was really surprised to hear about the possibility of social justification of The past? In the, in, the, in, the, in the end Permian extinction, the ocean was anoxic in deeper water. Uh, we know that from Black Sea-like deposits rimming what was that single global ocean. Um, and we know that there have been other times when that has happened. The, it's, you know, it's very much a function of the distribution of the continents and all sorts of things and the fact that the deep ocean circulation, which we actually don't understand that well, I mean, and the whole notion of whether or not the conveyor belt is even real and, and, and whether or not it, it does truly depend on sinking in the Northwest Atlantic and, and all those kinds of things. So there's huge, huge uncertainties with this. But the Black Sea, well, start with a lake. We all know that eutrophic lakes, uh, when in the summer, go anoxic at, deep, at depth because when they become thermally stratified and oxygen can't get down to the bottom, they go anoxic on the bottom and you have the die off in the bottom of the lake. We also know that the Black Sea is a comparable thing, okay, on a very large scale. It's the equivalent of a huge lake. We also know now that the dead zones of the global coastal ocean are an equivalent kind of situation. And they go anoxic to depth. And they have massive, I should have said that, they have massive die-offs of oxygen demanding organisms at depth. So all the shrimp go, all the fish go, all that sort of stuff happens. So all of these things happen, all of them are po possible. The only question for the future, and it is, it is like the cover of the Brave New World, it is speculation. But, you know, there are responsible, famous oceanographers at my institution who are talking about 
the first the drop of productivity and then the possibility of the thermal stratification of the ocean, which would in effect isolate the surface waters from depth, and so I embellish that to make it sound really awful. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs>